Okay, uh, <laughs> I am live, praise God. We are live. Look at you devotees, my gosh. It does not matter that it's 20 minutes past or how, however it is. On the roads, technology problems, praise Jesus. That's always a wonderful sign when you're giving a talk on spiritual warfare because the demons hate it and they love messing with technology let's go don making making a uh, time to pray inspiring people to pray let's go while you wait okay let's uh let's pray in the name of the father and of the son and the holy spirit amen come holy spirit father in the name of jesus i ask for an outpouring of your presence Spirit of God, fall upon us in Jesus' name. Lord, shower us with your graces, with your protection, with your anointing. Surround us with your holy angels and archangels. Precious blood of Jesus, cover us from head to toe. Mother Mary, we ask for your presence to protect us. Wrap us in your mantle. Surround us with your love, with your saints, as we pray. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women. And blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and in the hour of our death. Amen. Saint Michael, the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the divine power of God, cast into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl about the world, seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. Saint Gemma Galgani, pray for us. Saint Joseph, terror of demons, pray for us. Saint Joan of Arc, pray for us. All God's holy angels and saints, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Praise God. I am in a small town parish doing some preaching celebrating mass and i'm i'm by myself in the rectory the only living person near me in the proximity is jesus in the tabernacle in the holy eucharist so i may this night just walk in the church and potentially die of joy as i spend that time with jesus Maybe they'll find my body in the morning, cause of death, religious euphoria, ecstasy, but the good kind of ecstasy. <laughs> okay. Um, we will pray for Adina, who is dying of cancer. Okay, Lord, bless Adina. In Jesus' name, I pray for Our Lady's intercession, for an outbreak of graces upon her, for for Our Lady to meet her in the hour of death. Lord, consecrate her to you, Mother Mary. Um, okay, spiritual warfare, angels and demons, let's go. What a topic. First lesson in spiritual warfare, the most important lesson in spiritual warfare. God is so much greater. God is immense, absolutely immense, compared to the speck of dust that the devil is in comparison. God is creator, the devil is creature. Um, sometimes demons try to instill fear. They try to instill fear. In the process, they distort the reality or try to distort the reality that God is much greater and you have nothing to be afraid of. I was. Um, once uh, spending time with an exorcist, I was um, I had an interesting assignment. I had to dispose an unholy object. Somebody gave me an object that was a Wiccan altar. Don't ask me why. <laughs> and I had to dispose this thing. Uh, so I went to find this exorcist who it was like something out of a movie. He like lived an hour away in this small town in the middle of nowhere. And he had a special section in his garden uh, that is for the burial of unholy objects. And as we were talking, 
he shared with me the major lesson, the first major lesson that he um, was taught as an exorcist. So he was trained as an exorcist in Rome. And the first major lesson, uh, he was picked up at the airport by the great Spanish exorcist, Father Jose Antonio Fortua. You may know his book, um, Interview with an Exorcist. And as Father Jose Antonio is driving with him, he says to him, your first lesson in spiritual warfare, look outside, look at all that you see, look at the skies, the people, the birds, feel the air, the trees, all that is, all this exists under divine providence. All this exists through the power of God because God is holding it up. God is completely in control. That is the first lesson of spiritual warfare. He is all powerful. He is fully in control. Once again, that lesson of um, God is greater. The devil is a speck. Um, I have, you know, it's probably a grace. I have a grace in my life that I'm not afraid of the demonic. I've never really been afraid of the demonic. Um, and I, I, I like that, you know, there's nothing to fear. It's, it's good. I, I feel that when people are afraid, um, it's unnecessary. You're perhaps giving uh, uh, fuel to the fire, um, but it's also a deception. That's something that they would want from you. It's not necessary though. Uh, you know, there's a beautiful story often gets told of Teresa of Avila being awoken at night. She notices the devil there, the presence of the evil one. And she says, oh, it's just you. And she went back to sleep. That's how it should be. <laughs> um, how does the devil attack? There's five ways that demons attack, right? So there's ordinary demonic attacks and there's extraordinary demonic attacks. With an ordinary, there's one type. With an extraordinary, there's four types. And therefore, we have five. Um, let's briefly mention the extraordinary. Most people, 99% of people, will have to undergo the ordinary attacks. So although the extraordinary may seem more exotic, more interesting, more Hollywood-esque because of their preternatural quality, uh, most people want to have to deal with the extraordinary. So let's go through those quickly. Extraordinary attacks uh, from the demons. Infestation, oppression, obsession, and possession. So infestation pertains to demons spiritually infesting a territory, what in popular parlance would be called haunted house, right? If there's demonic activity in a location. Um, sometimes this can be based on the ba on this can be grounded on the basis of something dark happening in that location. Maybe it's a house where some horrible crime took place. Uh, maybe it's a house where there was uh, prostitution or some form of uh, intense mortal sin. Maybe it was a house where there was occult activity. And all those are gateways to the demonic. And sometimes demons can infest a territory. They're very territorial. So infestation, that's one aspect. Infestation can be uh, exuded through things like um, objects moving in the house that you didn't naturally move. Um, sometimes there can be an unnatural coldness in certain rooms. Uh, sometimes it can be knocks uh, on the walls, on the doors, you know, creepy stuff that you see in horror films. Um, Again, God is greater. These are just scare tactics. If you are dealing with the unique case of infestation, then, you know, it's, it's good to call a priest. It's good to have your house blessed. I think that most exorcists for cases of infestation would recommend 
um, having the house blessed. I, I know that there are certain ways of exercising the house with a, a special blessing. So it's, yeah, if somebody suffers with that problem, with that dilemma in their property, then it's good to get in touch with your local priests. And um, if he doesn't know how to deal with the situation, he may get in touch with the diocese, which um, which should have an exorcist team. Another form is oppression. Oppression is when demons can physically attack you. Some of the great saints have had attacks of oppression, right? Saints like Saint Padre Pio, Saint Gemma Gelgani, um, bruises on the body, um, sometimes cuts, sometimes the bruises um, or the cuts can come within, um, not externally, but you feel the pain. Um, so a lot of times it's actually, ironically, it's actually mystics, people of a very deep supernatural spiritual communion with the divine who may become victims of oppression. And a couple of things about oppression. First, although demons can technically, physically attack a person, uh, it's rare, but when it happens, it, it does happen. Um, they're not allowed to kill you. <laughs> Praise God. They're not allowed to kill you. So it's it's interesting. It's like God gives them a certain leeway, right? Because once again, God is in charge. It's divine providence. He is all powerful. He allows what he allows. And so he can allow demonic oppression. He can allow these attacks, but God absolutely does not allow them to kill you. So you'll be fine. Okay, so the question may be, well, why does he allow demonic oppression? Why do, you know, these people like St. Pio, St. Gemma get physically attacked? Um, it's a very special calling. It's a type of redemptive suffering. Sometimes the demon can be extremely angry with a soul that brings many to God. And oppression may be one possibility. John Vianney also had it very prominently, but it's an expression of redemptive suffering, suffering that has value, suffering that has meaning. So redemptive suffering is something that can exist on a level that is internal and external. So internally, redemptive suffering uh, can be sanctifying. It can sanctify the individual. It can help them grow in grace. Um, externally, it can be used as a form of intercession for others. The Lord uses our sufferings to help others, to bring grace into their lives, to help those who are far from God. So these pains are not without meaning. You know, there's a famous case of exorcism the case of Annalise Mikkel, a German girl uh, who I believe underwent exorcisms in the 70s, 1970s. If, I, if, I'm, if I'm not getting my dates wrong, it was either 70s or 80s. I think it was 70s. Um, and Annalise, and her case, by the way, was turned into a very good movie, The Exorcism of Emily Rose. It's an American version of the German case, but it's a very well done. Um, and Elise also experienced visions of Jesus and Mary. And once she had a Marian vision, a vision of Our Lady, and Our Lady said to her, And Elise, I can put an end to this. You know, you're suffering this possession. She was demonically possessed. Um, I can put an end to this. But... If you choose to continue with this, many souls will be saved and people will see that the realm of the spirit is real. Annalise, beautiful, 
innocent young soul, young woman, uh, college level uh, lady said, okay, I'll continue with the suffering because she realized that her possession, her struggle with the demonic, this wasn't meaningless. God was using it in the spirit realm. God was using it for graces for souls who need it. God was also using it to show the world that the spirit realm is real. Sometimes, ironically, people come to God. Um, not the journey begins from that for them not because of a love of God, but because of a fear of hell. Sometimes a person needs to realize that the demonic is real and they can stir the graces of conversion to a deeper faith. Um, but it begins, it begins with this realization that if demons are real, then God is real. If demons are real, then angels are real. If hell is real, then heaven is real. And I need to take that seriously. So beautiful example, beautiful example. Um, so oppression can have value meritorious suffering it happens you know and if, if it does happen you know there could be different situations so you know like there could be situations where maybe a person does need deliverance prayer it could be good to consult with the local exorcist the diocesan exorcist these days i think that most dioceses should have an exorcist team um or it could literally be a situation, it does happen, where a person is leading such a deep communion with God that occasionally they will be um, enduring such sufferings and that it's actually part of their vocation as a type of victim soul who is united in a very special way to Jesus crucified. And this includes offering the sufferings of uh, demonic oppression for the salvation of souls. It's actually a profoundly beautiful vocation, ugly but beautiful. Sometimes the greatest beauty comes in ugliness because the beauty is found in the love that for others and for Jesus, they are willing to suffer. Thank you, Jessa. Such a beautiful thing to say. Thank you. Um, okay, what's next? Obsession, let's go, obsession, yeah. Okay, obsession is, see, the demons hate that. They, they hate it when you're literally laughing at them because that's what I do. It's important to laugh at them. Their egotist, a huge ego. You know, Lucifer is a huge egotist, narcissist. So not taking them seriously while taking them seriously is a nice tactic. So, okay, obsession. Um, obsession is when demons affect your thoughts. They affect your thoughts and they make them obsessive. Uh, this can happen. Um, it's a type of very extraordinary attack. It can happen. I once experienced it. it. It was very interesting. I was a novice in religious life and I was in a hermitage, uh, like a 24 hour period in a hermitage by myself. And I noticed how um, okay, this is how it started for me. I'll just make it anecdotal, right? And from the anecdote, we'll talk about it. Chicha Um I took a nap in the hermitage, right? And when I took a nap, I had this vivid dream of a dark entity entering my body. And then I woke up. And when I woke up, it was like, it was like something out of a horror film, right? When I woke up... Um, I had these obsessive thoughts. It's like they, they were so intense and obsessive. Basically, every person who's ever hurt me in my entire life somehow was coming back obsessively uh, forefront of the mind. And it was so intense and continual. And of course, in the midst of it, you feel anger, frustration. It's perpetual. It doesn't go away, right? What on earth is going on, right? So like obsessive thoughts can exist in that way. Like it could be demons bringing back painful memories obsessively, bringing back people who have hurt you obsessively. Sometimes it can also be obsessive thoughts about blaspheming 
the Eucharist and things like that, where there are strange thoughts, there are sacrilegious thoughts, but it happens. Um, here's the other important note here. Um, not every negative thought is demonically influenced. So yes, certain thoughts can be demonically influenced. Others do not have to be. We'll talk about that a little more. Uh, just to finish my story. So yeah, I had this you know obsessive encounter and I went to church and I sat in front of the blessed sacraments and um, it wasn't going away. You know, um, had it throughout, had it even into the night. Woke up the next morning, my hermitage was over. I went to my novice director. I told him what's been happening because he asked me how the hermitage is going or went. And he was just inspired in the moment to pray over me and use his priestly authority in the name of Jesus by the power of his priesthood to uh, rebuke any evil that has come against me. And literally after his prayer, it disappeared. So the encounter also um, showed the power of the priesthood, the power of a priest using his authority in persona Christi, second Christ, another Christ, the power of speaking in the name of Jesus and rebuking evil. Um, why did it happen to me? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> That's the most honest answer. I don't know. You know, maybe, you know, maybe because... I teach about it now. You know, I, I teach classes on spirituality. I talk about these things obviously on YouTube. And sometimes the best teaching is personal testimony. The best teaching is personal example. And notice how I'm able to teach about a topic that would make a lot of people uncomfortable and allow you to understand it happens. It's not the end of the world. God is greater, the priesthood is greater in persona Christi. You know, we need to be able to live in that reality, the reality of the presence and power of God. I laugh at these things now. Why? Because I know who I am in the Lord. I know who I am as a priest. I know who I am through my baptism. I have supernatural sacred, royal power, authority that comes from the King of heaven and the Queen of heaven, Mary most holy. What are demons compared to that? They are nothing compared to that. Um, okay, what's next? Possession, right? Yes, or did I miss one? No, I think that's it, right? Yes, we did infestation, oppression, obsession. Next is possession. Possession is when a demon takes possession of your body. Now, notice the distinction here. It's usually possession of the body, not the soul. So why is that an important distinction? Usually, not always. But, uh, I'll clarify. Um, why is that an important distinction? Sometimes people ask this question. If an individual is demonically possessed, um, Will they go to hell? Let's say let's say that person's going through exorcisms and maybe they pass away before full deliverance happens, right? Um, and I'm not saying that they passed away because of the exorcism. Exorcisms are actually usually quite safe um, when they're done by professionals who have the sacred authority from the bishop. Um, I lost my train of thought, but that's okay. Okay, um, what was I saying? Yes. <laughs> um, <clears throat> okay, that question, that question of is a person who is possessed, are they in danger of going to hell because they're demonically possessed? No, because what is being possessed is their body, not their soul. The soul, the status of the soul, is what determines whether or not your eternity will be in heaven or hell. 
So a person can suffer the effects of demonic possession. There can be manifestations. The demons can manifest, uh, make it very difficult for them to function. Um, but it doesn't mean, it does not mean that they are in mortal sin, the individual. Because you know what's the greatest exorcism? It is confession. It is frequenting the sacraments. Frequenting the sacraments. It's it's funny, like, you know, one of the questions which I've already um, proposed, but here's an even better answer or another answer. One of the questions, you know, why does God allow these things? One answer, very powerful answer. I have heard uh, the great exorcist Monsignor Stephen Rossetti offer this answer, is that God allows such things because often it can bring a person into very deep spirituality because the person has to realize and learn that, that the demons, they cannot stand prayer. They cannot stand the Eucharist. They cannot stand you going to uh, confession. They cannot stand you sitting before the Blessed Sacrament for hours. This pains them. This literally gives them a spiritual pain and it's suffocating them. And eventually they'll want nothing to do with your soul and they'll leave, you know. So notice what's happening. God can allow something painful like the demonic possession, but through it leads a person to an intimately uh, deep spiritual life that actually works towards their salvation and their family salvation because the family is being affected by it as well. And they see how this person is growing in faith and it, it often does affect them as well. So yes, a profound good can come out of it because sometimes we get too obsessed with the natural, right? We get obsessed with um, what is wrong naturally you know my daughter is suffering my son is suffering right a uh, parent can get very preoccupied with that and obviously it makes sense you you love them deeply you don't you don't want to see your child suffer um but we often do not think about how the natural suffering can lead us to such a utter dependence on god that it ex amplifies our spirituality and our communion with the divine. And for that, there's great value to that suffering. There's great value to that poverty. Sometimes the Lord allows us to experience profound brokenness and poverty and suffering because it brings us to our knees and it brings us to an intimacy with him that comfort would never be able to bring us to. So suffering becomes a bridge to intimacy with the divine. Okay. Some people do experience these types of extraordinary manifestations. It happens. Oh, okay. Okay. Sorry. I didn't go. I should say more about possession. Okay. So I said that possession, most of the times it's possession of the body. How does it happen? A lot of times it's the individual who may have um, been playing around with things that they should not have been playing around with, Ouija, Ouija board, occult spirituality, uh, different new agey things that they may be experimenting with, um, inviting evil spirits. Sometimes it also may have been things like, that's right, Mary, those brass. So maybe things like... Um, uh, a person being cursed, right? But here's what I want to specify. You know, when people hear that, right, you know, that somebody was cursed, they may be afraid, you know, what if I get cursed? Well, your baptism and a strong sacramental life and a strong prayer life actually offer a type of spiritual armor for you, a lot of spiritual protection. So even against curses. So when you live the life of a devout Catholic, when you pray often, when you receive the Eucharist often, when you go to confession, when you try to honor our Lord and our lady, when you are present at the Holy Mass often, 
these are this is not only spiritual nourishment but it's also spiritual protection against evil you are walking with more spiritual authority than the person who wants to curse you now if a curse does happen you know there are prayers against it uh once again monsignor stephen rosetti has a great website and i think it's catholicexorcism.org uh in terms of uh renouncing curses and he does a monthly uh deliverance session uh if you haven't uh, seen it definitely go on his website he's a officially recognized exorcist in the archdiocese of washington dc and he leads people through zoom uh, through a live deliverance session that actually has strong effects on a lot of people a lot of healing effects through through deliverance prayer because that's what deliverance is it's a type of healing um so i mentioned that possession most of the times it happens against the body right the body is possessed it may feel like there's another entity taking control of the body uh having those demonic manifestations that are sporadic um there are very rare occasional situations where the demon possesses the soul these situations you can say are uglier because these are situations where a person has voluntarily invited the evil spirit in usually something like a um satanic ritual or an invitation to satan and i want to say this um because words have power because a spiritual invitation has power we need to see this also in light of the holy inversion so something like marian consecration for example when you are consecrating yourself to our lady you are saying mother i am all yours all my virtues my merits any graces that can come from them i give it all to you i invite you into my life in a deeper way notice when the devil does enter when people invite satan in and there can be a possession of the soul therefore in the inversion that should also tell us something about the power of spiritual invitation when we say to our lady the mother of god she who stomps the serpent she who does battle with the dragon i'm yours i consecrate myself to you that these aren't just words these aren't just you know empty prayers this is real a lot of times a person will say that their life changed after they've done the saint louis de montfort consecration right that they've noticed tangible differences tangible differences and it is because they have given our lady the right to have more control over their life more uh, power over them which is a beautiful reality you know we should in terms of possession we should seek to be possessed by the holy spirit right because here's the thing about possession this is fascinating it's going to be fascinating okay you ready for this fascinating possession demonic possession is a mockery of the incarnation because so often what the demons do is they create a parallel a parallel inversion a parallel mockery a mimicry because they can only mimic God they cannot have divine power right so the incarnation of course is God becoming man God, who is pure spirit, taken upon himself human flesh. And that is a beautiful union between spirits, between God and humanity. Demonic possession, a demon entering a human body and trying to control that body in a negative way is a mockery of the incarnation. Now, here's the other matter that's important to emphasize. When a person is demonically possessed, they may scream out curses blasphemies 
rotten, nasty, ugly things because that's the language of the demons. Their language is cursing and blaspheming and rage and anger. Question becomes, is that person culpable for those actions, right? Blasphemy, cursing, those are ugly things. Do they need to go to confession for that? No, because their will is compromised. It's not them who are doing it. It's the demon within. Therefore, the person themselves are not culpable of the sin, and therefore they are not in mortal sin when it's a demonic manifestation that produces those ugly uh, expressions. Um, yeah, there's power in language, dear brothers and sisters. There's power in language. I often say that to people, you know. There's notice that when a person is demonically manifesting, as I just emphasized, there will be cursing, there will be blasphemy. This is the language of the demons. That means that when you curse, when you blaspheme, you are not only emulating the demons, but you're actually inviting demons, right? Sometimes you can notice how the atmosphere changes on the basis of what has been spoken, right? Words have power. Words have power that can penetrate and also influence, affect the spiritual environment around us attract angels or attract demons um, sometimes a heaviness enters oftentimes an inexplicable heaviness that a lot of people are experiencing can be a uh, sign of demonic presence right so it happens often when you're preparing a ministry preparing a big ministry maybe there's a big prayer meeting the next day or if it's like a ordination the next day and you're at the rehearsal the previous day there could be heaviness that other people are experiencing in that heaviness they feel more of an anxiety people losing their temper but you notice it's a little unnatural it's like present throughout the area everybody's feeling it that's a signifier that that's demonically influenced it's not just joe who has a bad temper right it's everybody's feeling heavy and anxious and agitated because once again demons are territorial so sometimes they'll try to affect the territory if an event is transpiring that can advance the kingdom of god and hurt the kingdom of darkness right so it happened uh, before my ordination, the day before my ordination, and uh, my classmates were being ordained with me. It was rehearsal. It was heavy, man. It was a heavy rehearsal. You know, people <laughs> people seemed agitated, people losing their temper. This heaviness was present, this anxiety that was just a little too palpable. And that's spiritual warfare. That's an example of spiritual warfare, especially the signifier there is that everybody's experiencing it. It's territorial. It happens uh, in, in the locality, in the territory. Um, but it's also a good sign. <laughs> it's a good sign. If it's happening, it means you're doing something that is meaningful. You're doing something that is important. I had a wise spiritual director wise spiritual director that said you should be afraid if the demons aren't attacking you know if they are good shows you're on the right track shows you're doing something right you know they don't bother they don't waste time with people who they already have in their grasp right but if they are attacking you because you're very active in the life of the church and the life of the spirits, that's a compliment. It's a backhanded compliment. Um, Gwen has an interesting question. I once heard an exorcist say that Satan and Lucifer are different spirits. Could you please address this? Yes, Gwen, I can. Um, okay, so exorcists have a disagreement. Some say that Satan and Lucifer are two 
distinct demons, while others argue that it is one demon. The argument that says that it is one demon uh, pertains to the usage of the name in the different stages of spiritual denigration. So, for example, when God first created Lucifer, he created him as an angel of light. And hence, the word Lucifer means uh, light bearer, right? So, for example, even, even in church, when we have uh, the altar boys or girls who are holding the candles, the technical name for them is the Lucifer. That's obviously not a demonic attack. That means that they're the light holder, the light bearer. So one interpretation is that when God created him as this bright angel of light, his name was Lucifer. But then when he sinned and denigrated his nature and fell and became a beast, became a demon, that his name or what he is called by was changed to Satan because Satan means accuser and that this was a reflection of his denigration. So that's one theory, the theory that it's one demon, two, na uh, two names, the names being uh, attributable to the different uh, stages of spiritual regression in this fallen angel's existence. The other theory is simply that there are two separate demons, two powerful separate demons. A lot of times what exorcists know about the different demons and their demonic personalities comes anecdotally. It's not something that the catechism has a lot of answers to. The catechism has some answers of spiritual warfare, but a lot of exorcistic wisdom comes from being in the fields, experiencing demons, and eventually exorcists even recognize demonic personalities. They can identify them. Um, and there are certain commonalities that a demonic personality has. Uh, so a demon is full of rage. It's a raging personality. A demon is also very narcissistic. Um, and also what's important to recognize is what the demon will try to inspire in you. So for example, we've mentioned how demons can at times affect your thoughts. Demons will try to inspire a few thoughts, few central thoughts. One thought is, God doesn't love me. God doesn't care. Another thought is, I'm disgusting to God. Another thought is, I should end my life. That's the worst one. Notice that with the first two, the demons aren't actually denying the existence of God. No, not at all. What they're doing is they're trying to completely distort your relationship with God. And when they distort the relationship, it becomes an attack on your identity because your identity in your perception and your false perception is no longer rooted in God when that temptation becomes internalized. So um, that first one, God doesn't love me or God is disgusted by me. These are demonic attacks. You rebuke them. God loves unconditionally. You can be the greatest sinner or the holiest saint. God loves you unconditionally. He loves you whether you're in a low state, whether you're in a high state, whether you're happy, whether you're depressed, whether you just committed mortal sin or whether you've been elevated to the highest spiritual levels. He loves you unconditionally and that unconditional love will never be taken away. Never. Um, yeah, they want you to question that because they always want to attack your relationship with God. That relationship needs to be at the center. And yeah, and they like to attack that. Um, some demons are immature. 
<laughs> you know, it's funny, like, like you know, I think uh, Monsignor Rossetti writes about this, how certain demons, like lower level demons, almost have like an immature sense of humor sometimes, while higher level demons may be more serious. So it's also interesting how there's diverse personalities. Oh, look at this question, Diana. Look at you. Nice question. Father, when the devil tempts your imagination, he can't read your mind, correct? That's a good question, right? Question that we often hear. Can the demons read your mind? They cannot. They cannot read your mind because reading your mind, reading your soul is a spiritual gift. It is a gift of the Holy Spirit. However, demons as superior intellects, right? They have angelic intellects. They're fallen angels. And angels have intellects that are higher than human intellects. Because they have superior, higher intellects, they can use those intellectual powers, faculties, to give the impression that they are reading your soul, which they're not actually doing. So it's uh, it's deceptive, you know, the demon, the devil is the father of lies and deceptions. But let me give an example. So let's say you lost someone, somebody close in your family died. So let's say your sister passed away, if you have a sister. And let's say you attended the funeral and in the spirit realm, a demon is observing, noticing your grief. And let's say that you are present at an exorcism. Let's say you're part of an exorcism team. A, an exorcist priest usually works with laity who are prayer warriors who intercede with him. The demon who is present at the funeral may communicate instantaneously through thoughts to another demon who is at the exorcism that this person lost their sister exploit this so the demon at the exorcism may say ah you know, your sister she's in hell with us right so notice what just happened there it seems like the demon read your soul or mind how on earth does he know that my sister died but of course that's not what happens it was simply a high level communication between angelic spirits they literally communicate faster than we human beings can they don't use speech language it's almost like an instantaneous thought enters one and communicates to the other because they're they are spirits they are not bodies and notice how the demon also will exploit it right he'll say something like she's in hell with us and that can be an absolute lie but he wants to exploit your vulnerability and your grief in the moment so that's why it's also important to recognize that they are liars and deceivers and to recognize that even when they speak things that may make you question how could he have known that therefore it must be true no he can still have certain knowledge as a high level angelic intellect that receives a communication um that isn't reading your soul that's simply deducing deducing um the situation um, with the help of other fallen angels. Somebody asked Father Klimek if a family urgently needs an exorcist for their family, how can they find one? Uh, the most important thing is to contact your diocese because exorcists have authority within their diocese. So, for example, an exorcist who has authority in the Diocese of Washington, D.C., you know, should be performing exorcists in exorcisms in Washington, D.C. That's where he has his faculties, his authority given by the bishop. So if you do actually have someone in the family who needs an exorcism, um, it's locality. Spiritual authority is found in localities, in dioceses. The shepherd, of course, is the bishop, and he should have an exorcist available. Hopefully he does. There are certain bishops, unfortunately, who, who are not as open to exorcism, although I believe John Paul II decreed that every diocese should have one in the world. Um, okay, so most people will experience 
ordinary demonic attacks, not extraordinary. So we, we just went through the four ones that exist in the category of extraordinary, right? Oppression, infestation, obsession, possession. Extraordinary, most people will not experience them. Some may, yes. Um, ordinary, 90% of people, if not more, will experience ordinary demonic attacks. Ordinary demonic attacks are temptations, the ways that demons can tempt us. Now, here's the important point. Not every temptation comes from the devil. There are three sources of temptation. The world, the flesh, and the demon. Those are three areas from which a temptation can arise. So when we say the world, it means the cultural influence that surrounds you. If you're spending a lot of time on social media or the internet or movies, and there's provocative images, lustful images, those can be temptations that come from your habits of um, time on the internet or movies or shows or whatever it is, but it, it comes from the world. It comes from your encounter and interaction with the world. Um, it's not necessarily demonically influenced, even if the demon, you know, in some distant relationship, uh, causality, I should say, affected, you know, a person who who's on the screen or whatever, right? Still directly, it's your encounter with the world. Um, the flesh, we all have been touched by the original sin. We all suffer for from concupiscence. Concupiscence, the effects of it, it is, it is uh, having an effect on the will and the mind, especially. So with, with the will, concupiscence can weaken the will and it can also um, make our reason cloudier but with con and it's it's also of course um inclinations passions towards sin now here's the thing with concupiscence how strongly you feel its effects will often be based on how strong or how weak your spiritual life is. So a lot of times, temptation will happen. And that's not an issue. It's, it's part of life. Jesus was sent into the desert to be tempted. That's what the gospel says. Jesus was sent into the desert by the Spirit in order to be tempted. Isn't that interesting? The Spirit of God sends Jesus into the desert to be tempted. Why? Because he's showing us that part of spiritual growth and he wants to be a model to us is overcoming temptations. So temptation will come. That's not, that's not an issue. It will happen. The question is, when it happens, are you going to be ready for it? And a lot of people make this mistake. They'll say, Father, what do I need to do when the temptation comes? Should I start praying against it? You know? And yeah, of course, you should start praying. But here's the thing. Whether you're going to be able to overcome that temptation or not is often based on what you did before it arrived. And I'm talking about your spiritual life. If your spiritual life has been strong, if you spend, you know, significant amount of time in prayer every day, spiritual reading every day, word of God every day, if you protect your senses against the world, against too much media exposure, too much provocative media exposure, you're going to be protected when the temptation comes. It may be there and it may not have such a strong effect on you because you are wearing the spiritual armor of God, which is a life of prayer, a life of purity. If you haven't been praying strongly, if you haven't made prayer a daily discipline, if you haven't made 
an intentional act of communing with God, but you've been sloppy with it, then when temptation comes, that temptation is going to have more of a grasp on you. It is going to be more tempting. And notice, it's not simply, it's not simply, oh, the temptation this time was too big. No, what was too small was your prayer life. You came into it unprepared. You came into it um, spiritually malnourished, right? Um, so that's important. That's very important. You know, when temptations are stronger in my life, I can often notice if I am willing, and we all should be willing, to give myself honest, difficult self-examination is I've been sloppy. I've been spiritually lazy. I have not been giving as much as I should to my relationship with God. And yes, I am feeling the temptation stronger right now. It's not that the temptation has gotten bigger. It's that my life and the spirit has gotten smaller. So that's so essential. That's so essential. I, I've, I've had periods in my life, literally periods in my life, where I go years, years without experiencing temptation of the flesh. Why? Because it's communing with God well. Yes, there are special graces that he may give you in certain periods of your life. Sometimes when you're, you had a conversion experience, you may be going through a type of honeymoon period, more consolation, more graces, all this, absolutely. But it's also about your own consistency in the relationship. The relationship with God is actually absolutely that. It's a relationship. And we must honor a relationship by spending time with the person that we love. We spend time with Jesus Christ. We spend time with Mother Mary through prayer, through daily prayer. And it is the love of that intimacy which, which increases grace and spiritual stamina within us that, protect us from, that protects us from the attacks of the enemy. Okay, so the world, concupiscence, and the devil. The world can be overcome not just by faith, but also by reason. That's really important, right? Because sometimes you can spend three hours in prayer, but then spend five hours looking up whatever you look up on the internet, including crazy stuff that leads you to a dark rabbit hole. And next thing you know, you're on pornography, right? Crazy. It happens. We need to be responsible rationally with our actions, with technology, with the eye gates. What am I allowing to enter my field of vision? You know what the gospel says. You know what the gospel says. To keep your eye pure. When you do, when there's light in your eyes, when you keep your eyes in the light, your soul is pure. Your soul is in the light. And so there's a teaching there, not only spiritual, but also rational. Am I making good, rational choices that are protecting me from unhealthy temptations? The Lord gave us faith and reason we need to use those rational faculties. Well, always remind yourself that every struggle against temptation is going to be victorious. because it is an act of love what i mean what i mean by this is this sometimes a person may think i'm going to overcome this i'm going to be strong i'm going to pray a lot i'm going to be wise i i i i <laughs> that's trouble right so yes pray a lot yes be wise but also realize that this isn't about you and your actions but it's also about relationship relationship with Jesus and Mary, their sufferings at Calvary, his, his sufferings on the cross and her sufferings at the foot of the cross. I want to honor these relationships. I want to honor his blood and her tears. I want to meditate on them. And I want to not lead them to more suffering. They have suffered enough. They don't need my sin to add to their suffering relationship 
with the beloveds must be key in overcoming temptation. Also, you may come to a place where you feel extreme temptations. Sometimes you may even be spiritually nourished, praying a lot, and the temptations have increased. Sometimes the demons will increase temptations if the temptation is demonic, um, when they see that you are growing in your spiritual life. And what's important in those moments is surrender. Sometimes it's as simple as spiritually articulating your poverty when you feel bombarded by those temptations to literally say from the depths of your soul, Lord Jesus, help me. I can't do this. Mother Mary, help me. I can't do this. Holy angels, help me, please. I can't do this. That is one of the greatest prayers. There's an explosion of grace that happens in those prayers because his grace is made perfect through our weakness, through our poverty. A lot of times God doesn't need your confidence. He needs your poverty. Your confidence can be a block from surrender and from a deeper reception of his grace. Your poverty, however, opens the floodgates of graces because that's when the father realizes you are calling upon him because you are realizing how without him you can do nothing. And he says, I'm here. I'm here for you, child. Thank you for calling upon me. Okay, so temptations, ordinary temptations, world, flesh, demon. When it's demonic, how can I tell? How can I tell um, if a temptation is natural or preternatural? Preternatural is another word that we use for demonic. So sometimes you hear those three categories, supernatural, preternatural, and natural. Preternatural can sometimes be interchangeably used with paranormal. Preternatural or paranormal usually apply to demonic entities. Supernatural applies to gods. If something is a supernatural phenomenon, whether it's a Marian apparition or a stigmata, we say that it's divine, it's from God. If it's paranormal, preternatural, we say it's demonic. If it's natural, it's of human origin. So how can I tell whether a temptation is from the flesh or the demon? Sometimes you cannot. Sometimes it's difficult to tell, to distinguish the origin. Other times you can. And I've already hinted at this. Other times, like, I, so one indication. One indication is... Um, Demons are territorial. Demons are territorial. So sometimes you may have you may have experiences. I know this happens at seminaries. I've been there. Probably happens with families as well. You may have experiences where everybody had a tough night. Everybody had trouble sleeping. Some people struggled with temptations. And in the end or in the morning, everybody looks tired, beaten up, all this. It was territorial. It happened in the whole locality. It wasn't just one individual struggling. That's an indication that there was more of a higher level of spiritual activity and that it was probably demonic. Um, other indications that something is demonic is if there is an inexplicable heaviness that is being experienced. Sometimes it could be you're not feeling naturally nervous. You're not nervous about anything. Your mind isn't going to anxious places. And yet, why do I feel this heaviness? Why is my hand shaking? I'm not thinking about any, anything anxious, any fearful episode, any upcoming you know, fearful expectation but my body feels heavy and anxious, my body's trembling. 
that's also an indication that something is demonic. It's almost like this inexplicable heaviness that doesn't make sense on a natural level. This event that is coming up is not making me nervous, but I am feeling nervous. Um, as mentioned, a lot of times demonic activity will also be present in relation to activities that can benefit the kingdom of God. So a lot of times people in ministries will experience demonic attacks. It's a compliment, you know, don't be afraid. It, it means that you're doing something important for the kingdom of light. Um, it can happen through the things already mentioned, a heaviness and inexplicable anxiety, a um, territorial, spiritual presence, spiritual energies that are affecting people's moods, uh, making them more agitated. Perhaps somebody yelled at you unjustly and it just seems so inexplicable that person could have been demonically influenced to do so. Um, yeah, sometimes, yeah, sometimes that's interesting. You know, sometimes like the saints have those occurrences. Saints are people who a lot of them have had profound violations, unfortunately, against their human dignity. You know, like uh, Saint Gemma Galgani, beautiful soul, beautiful saint who I love so much. She once had an experience where she's walking with someone and they encountered a young priest. And the young priest, who didn't even know her, started inexplicably yelling at her. It was strange and demonic and vicious, right? Sometimes the demon can be so negatively enraged by the presence of a person who has a deep communion with God that the demon can affect or influence a spiritually immature individual, as this priest evidently was from this story, you could tell, uh, to verbally attack the person of deep communion with God. So it, it does become a type of the price that you pay for being close with the Lord Jesus. But that's okay. Jesus is everything, you know. The relationship with him is everything. You know, the apostles and the Acts of the Apostles said that they are rejoice because they have had the honor of suffering for the name of Jesus, right? To come to the place where you're so in love with him that you can rejoice when somebody attacks you because of your communion with God is a special place of deep personal intimacy. Um, protecting yourself from demonic temptations. Here's the thing, like, protecting yourself from demons is the greatest thing. What it essentially is, is a deep spiritual life and a deep sacramental life. To be the person who wakes up early, to spend time in prayer before the day begins, to be the person who prays a daily rosary is close to Our Lady, to be the person who tempers how much technology they consume because they want to honor the eye gate, what gets in the field of vision that affects your soul. To be the person who goes to frequent Mass, frequently receives the Eucharist, who communes with Jesus. To be the person who reads scripture and great spiritual readings, mystics and saints, and speaks scripture over their lives. Speaks and encourages um, others in terms of sacred words, sacred language that uplifts. So, that's great. <laughs> right? It means that... It, it means that why on earth would I be afraid of a demon when the presence of a demon just leads me to be closer to God, right? If the way that you protect yourself from these, you know, immature, antagonistic, angelic creatures that the Lord made is by living a strong, sacramental, spiritual life and coming closer to Jesus Christ and Our Lady, then thank you very much. I will proudly protect myself because not, not that I'm afraid of you, demon, but I love Our, Our Lady and I love Our Lord and I want to grow in intimacy and love with them. If you're helping me to do so with your attacks, thank you. <laughs> you know? Um, okay. Why? Why did... 
the angels fall? Why did they betray God? The ones that decided to follow Lucifer and become demons, oppose God. There was a war in heaven. Michael and his, and his angels fought against the dragon and his angels. And the dragon was defeated. And his tail swept down a third of the stars from heaven. The book of Revelation chapter 12 tells us, so a third of the angels were swept down and became demons. Why did it happen? The most prominent theory is one supported by scripture and church fathers and great theologians throughout the tradition is the incarnation that the incarnation was a offense to some of the angels because the incarnation meant that angels who are pure spirits and therefore greater in their nature than human beings because we are corrupted by human flesh our human flesh includes the concupiscence our human flesh also blocks us from having a higher angelic intellect like they have they would have to worship God in a nature that is lower than their own as God takes upon himself human flesh so Lucifer and the angels who followed him said, no, we will not worship him as a human being. The incarnation was too humbling. It was seen as an offense because of the humility that it required. It also meant serving man, serving humanity as their guardian angels. So the angels would know about the incarnation of course, before it actually happened as a historical event, because what happens in heaven, including the angelic warfare, uh, is outside of time. And the incarnation was the event the church fathers believe, and the scripture supports this book of Revelation, chapter 12, that led Lucifer and his followers to say no to God. We will not worship him in a nature lower than our own. This is also why Our Lady is so important. Lucifer's great no is countered by the great fiat, the handmaid of the Lord. Behold, I am the handmaid of the Lord. Her yes is a yes to the incarnation. Her yes is a yes to the very event that Lucifer said no to. Therefore, she becomes the true light bearer. The name Lucifer, as mentioned, means light bearer. Our lady becomes the true light bearer. She counters him. She brings God into the world in human flesh. She is someone who is so essential in this narrative. The book ends of scripture, Genesis and Revelation. First book of scripture, Genesis, Genesis 3.15. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, between her offspring and yours. That's God speaking to the serpent. Enmity is a word that represents complete and radical opposition. So the woman will have nothing to do with you. She will not be touched by sin. She will have no participation with you whatsoever. There will be complete enmity. And then the last book of scripture, Revelation chapter 12, the war, the war between the woman and the dragon. How do they defeat him? How do the followers of Jesus defeat him? The book, of the book of Revelation chapter 12 tells us they defeated him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. So notice the blood of the Lamb, 
the passion, the cross, the sacrifice of the Lord, the Eucharist, but also the word of their testimony. There is spiritual power in your testimony, the way the, the Lord has worked in your life. When you share that testimony, it can sometimes break spiritual bondage. What do I mean by this? Sometimes the greatest conversions, when a person has a life-changing conversion happens, sometimes not because they went to Mass, not because they saw a movie, but because they heard somebody's testimony. And the testimony spoke to the wonders of God and the goodness of God and the mercy of God. And it touched them on a deep level. It resonated with them. And there were demonic strongholds that slowly are breaking away. Strongholds where this person thought, God doesn't love me. God could never have mercy on me. I must discuss God with my life. But this person who was a bigger sinner shared their testimony. This person who had three abortions shared their testimony. And now she's a pro-life speaker. And now she's somebody who is a light for heaven. God transformed her life. He can do the same for me. By the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, that's how they defeat the evil one. Do not ever take for granted the power of your testimony. And it's something that's precious because it's yours. Nobody can tell you that it's false, right? If they do, they are speaking without experience. Presumption and arrogance. Your testimony is yours. You have experienced God in a specific way. Some of you have written in the comments here today, sharing about your own spiritual battles, right? I mentioned that the extraordinary form of demonic attacks are things that most people do not experience. But I certainly am not surprised when people share with me that they have experienced it because a lot of times they can happen to very devout people. And that's beautiful. That's beautiful because it's a, it's a testimony via negativa, right? It's a testimony in the inversion where sometimes people will realize that the realm of the spirit is real because they hear about how the demonic has acted in your life. Once again, the case of Annalise Mikkel. I know a person who had a big conversion and is leading a very radical holy life. And part of that conversion was seeing the movie The Exorcism of Emily Rose, a movie that can scare the hell out of you, quite literally, right? That's good. That's good. There could be a use to that. You know, sometimes the demon allows himself to be unwittingly used by God. God can use at times the presence of the demonic to inspire faith in a person's life. Because so many people in our culture are absolutely inundated and drunk with the false chalice of rationalism and naturalism this belief that there's no supernatural realm this belief that there's no spiritual realm this belief that there's no heaven or hell there's no soul there's no eternity that we are simply material beings that's the false belief in some ways that's the greatest demonic temptation the greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world he didn't exist forget that Forget that. If the inversion is showing people that the realm of the spirit is real because demonic possession is real, then demonic possession just played a role that benefited the kingdom of God. Once again, God can use the devil, unwittingly by the devil, for his goods. So I say this in order to help you realize that when you do experience certain attacks when you do experience certain oppressions there is a higher purpose there often is a higher purpose um, it's very important 
to see it in that high bigger picture because if you do not see it in the bigger picture if you just simply make it about yourself then i think that can also be a doorway to falling into an unfortunate um victim mentality right woe is me and and a mentality that perhaps is not giving enough trust in the courage strength and power of god's light light god is all powerful we who are close to him should not be afraid ever you know what happens to me i used to get demonic attacks at night you know i used to get them at night when i was younger uh, even in grad school sometimes just this intense presence of evil in the bedroom you felt it it, it was palpable when i was younger it may be un it may be uncomfortable these days when it happens Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> you know, wow, it happens at night. I feel that tangible, palpable presence of evil in the room. Literally, you feel that spiritual entity is so strong that you're like, there's no question. There's some demonic activity here tonight. I praise Jesus. Because you know what it means? It means that tomorrow, something important is happening. Tomorrow, something great is happening. Tomorrow there will be some benefit for the kingdom of God. That has often been my experience. The devil will attack often before an important event. I noticed it. I noticed I, I once had a talk to give to a small group. I wasn't thinking much about the talk. I wasn't giving it too much uh, attention. It wasn't a huge preoccupation for me. It's a talk that I've given before. But then there was an intense demonic attack the night before. And I, when I woke up, I was like, oh, okay, this talk is going to be important. And I, I went to give the talk, and there was a much more spirit-filled talk than I was expecting. The power of God really showed up. The presence of God really came. People were moved on a deep, holistic level that included a deeper encounter with the Holy Spirit. I wasn't expecting that. The demon showing up at night with his temptations, with his attacks, with his palpable evil, gave it away. So I'm happy to get the news early. Thanks for letting me know. Thank you very much. You know, that's, that's it. That's good. Okay. Praise Jesus and Our Lady. Let's, um, let's say a prayer. A lot of talk about the demons. Let's, uh, let's invite the angels in. In the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, I ask for an outpouring of your Holy Spirit upon everyone who is watching and listening, and upon everyone who will watch and listen later on the recordings. Spirit of God, I ask that you just cleanse them right now in Jesus' name. Any negative thoughts, may they be cleansed by the precious blood of Jesus and by the power of the Holy Spirit, any remnants that are not of God be cleansed in Jesus' name and by the authority of my priesthood. In the name of Jesus, I speak a spirit of courage, confidence upon you. I pray impartation in the name of Jesus Christ. Holy Spirit, fall upon them right now. Strengthen them. Fill them with light. Fill them with anointing. Fill them with empowerment. Fill them with a knowledge of the deep dignity, royal dignity that they have as royal sons and daughters of God. Live in that royalty, dear son and daughter. Live in that strength, in that identity. Come, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. Fall upon them right now, Lord, in Jesus' name. Precious blood of Jesus, cover them from head to toe. Wrap them in your mantle, Mother Mary. Holy angels and archangels, I invite you to surround your children right now as I pray over them. Surround them, holy angels from heaven. Surround their families, surround their homes. Bless their homes, Lord Jesus. Mother Mary, I, inv I invoke your presence to be with us, to be with these dear souls as we pray. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruits of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, 
now and in the hour of our death. Amen. Saint Michael, the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the divine power of God, cast into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl about the world, seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. Saint Gemma Galgani, pray for us. Saint Benedict, pray for us. Saint Ignatius of Loyola, pray for us. Saint John Marie Vianney, pray for us. Saint John Paul II, pray for us. Saint Teresa of Avila, pray for us. Saint Jacinta, pray for us. There are certain saints who are uh, very involved in spiritual warfare, certain saints that the demons cannot stand. And when we invoke their names, we are invoking their presence. We are inviting their presence. Jacinta, the demons cannot stand her. Little Jacinta from Fatima, she was such a spiritual powerhouse and she continues to be a spiritual powerhouse from heaven. Saint John the Baptist, pray for us. Saint Charbel, pray for us. Saint Rita, pray for us. Saint Paul, pray for us. Saint Maria Goretti, pray for us. Saint Paul of the Cross, pray for us. Saint Mary Magdalene, pray for us. Saint Catherine of Siena, pray for us. Saint Francis of Assisi, pray for us. Saint Claire of Assisi, pray for us. Saint Padre Pio, pray for us. Saint Elizabeth of the Trinity, pray for us. Saint Joseph, terror of demons, pray for us. Our Lady, Queen of Peace, Queen of our hearts, Queen of heaven and earth, Queen of the angels, Queen of the heavenly armies, pray for us. All God's holy angels and saints, pray for us. And may the five wounds of Christ give you strength. May the Blessed Virgin protect you. May the holy angels and archangels surround you. And may Almighty God bless you, Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Go in the strength and the love of the Lord, surrounded by the angels and saints and our Holy Mother, surrounded by immense, majestic, supernatural power from heaven. You are anointed ones, anointed ones walking in the power of God and with the power of God, surrounded by angels. There is so much strength around you, spiritual strength. Forget about it. Demons cower in the presence of a holy Christian. Let's go. Love you all. Praying for you. You pray for me. God bless you. <laughs>